Hi, I'm Bill Turner, Vice President of Schneider Optics. I'd like to take a couple minutes to tell you about our Century line of lens accessories and our Schneider filters. Century Optics is committed to providing a complete range of lenses to give the videographer the widest range of choices in terms of its framing, the type of shots, and field of view. Fisheye lenses are the widest of that group. Uh, Fisheye lenses are named because of a particular type of distortion, which is a bending of straight lines so that they barrel outward. And this, this effect is strongest near the edge of the field. These type of lenses are commonly used in action sports and music videos where the unique look and perspective adds creative value. Century makes a full range of fisheyes that fit on everything from very small cameras with 37 millimeter uh, threaded attachments up to large high def broadcast camera lenses. These fisheye attachments are what we call adapters. They are not an afocal attachment. They will not allow the lens on the camera to be focused and zoomed normally. They must be used with the camera lens set to the wide angle position and depend on the camera's ability to focus up close in the macro mode at wide angle to achieve a sharp image. You are using them to achieve the effect of a fixed wide fisheye lens, uh, not a zoom lens. Because of the small weight and the lack of bayonets, this simply threads right on to the front of the camera, but allows these cameras to be used uh, commonly in POV uh, type things, everything from skydiving to uh, other applications where the extreme compactness of the camera is an advantage. The front of these, most of these lenses is actually plastic and we believe that trying to repeatedly screw heavy accessories in and out of these fine threads creates issues uh, as well as being time consuming. Therefore, wherever possible, we attach our accessories via these bayonets, which makes for a very easy, quick, one-handed operation that locks the lens securely on the front of the camera and also allows it to be quickly and easily removed when it's no longer being used. Our extreme fisheye lenses are two element designs that are intended to provide very close to a 180 degree field of view corner to corner. These are very carefully designed to provide the highest level of performance and using the best available materials. Because of its size and weight, it's designed to be used with a support system, standard 15 millimeter rod systems. At the back, it does use the bayonet mount, but the bayonet mount is intended simply to ensure that the adapter is held properly, squarely, and snugly up to the front of the camera lens. It's not meant to be support the weight of the unit. You have to use a support system with it. Okay, line up the two dots. Here are the cutouts for the bayonets. And when it's snugged up, simply rotate, which locks it onto the front of the camera. So it simply has to be put on over the rods pushed back till it's snug, tightened, the lock ring locked. Adapter is much smaller, it's lighter, very wide, minimally distorted field of view. A single element which relies on using the camera zoom lens at full wide angle and in the macro mode to achieve sharp focus. So it is not a zoom through attachment. In practical fact, the camera's, many cameras ability to autofocus or track focus in the manual mode will allow you to do small zooms or maybe even zoom through as much as half of the lens's range before you lose the ability to hold focus. But once again, this would only be in the autofocus mode. So we do not consider these to be zoom through attachments. 
they are a lightweight, compact, cost-effective way to achieve a wider field of view than the camera lens alone. Once again, we offer them in a complete range to fit cameras from uh, as small as 37 millimeter front threads up through full-size broadcast camera zoom lenses. Attachments are typically rated in a po some power that's a decimal or fraction, 0 0.55, 0 0.6, 0 0.7. This refers to the power of the attachment. So in simple terms, a 0.5 wide angle adapter would double the field of view of the lens. A 0.7 would be 30% wider than the lens alone. Though optically it is a simple device, it needs to be executed well to perform well. The element has to be properly shaped. We use multi-layer coatings. In this case, the issue is not increasing the transmission because it's only a single element. The light loss would be minimal, but to reduce the chance of surface reflections, flare, and ghosting. That is one of the key reasons why multi, you know, high quality multi-coated elements are very important, whether it be in a filter or in a wide angle adapter. Uh, high quality aluminum alloy housing, it's again the yellow dots that are used to line up the bayonet system for mounting and the bayonet lock ring itself with the cutouts, which then simply rotated to lock on the camera. Wide angle lenses also exaggerate perspective and motion. If the subject moves close to the lens, the speed of movement is exaggerated as they pass the lens and recede. The most difficult thing in designing a, a zoom lens that has significant range to it, a 10 times, 12 times, 15, 20 times lens, is designing the wide angle. Uh, wide angle typically results in a zoom lens becoming larger, heavier, and more expensive. For that reason, the camcorders, which feature a, a built-in non-interchangeable lens, typically are not as wide as the user would like in many instances. Best solution to that problem is a wide angle converter. The converter maintains the infinity focus of the original camera lens allows the lens to be used normally through its full zoom range but results in a wider angle of view. Because of the complexity of designing a lens that will work through the entire zoom range and to try to keep the size and weight within reason, the power or wide angle factor of the wide angle converters is less than of a wide angle adapter, typically ranging between 0.7 and 0.8 depending upon the application. Uh, these are multi-element designs uh, varying between, typically between three and four elements. You can see that the adapter is much smaller, it's lighter, than the wide angle converter. The wide angle converter has four elements, the 0.6 has one. Once again, the difference is the wide angle adapter only works with the lens in its wide angle position using macro focus to achieve focus and gives a fixed wide view. It's not intended for zoom through. The wide angle converter allows you to use the lens's full zoom range but gives a wider field of view. The adapter is actually a little bit wider than the converter and costs about half as much. The thing that's important is to choose the product that works best for your particular application. People doing documentary type work uh, where they don't want to have to worry about removing the adapter, just leave it on and use it all the time the wide angle converter is typically the better solution. The converter has a 105 millimeter OD specifically to make sure it would be compatible with 
most of the map boxes out there in the marketplace made by Crozeal, Vocus, and others. Whether it's shooting sports, uh, wildlife, or just the need to get an cl extreme close-up from a distance, uh, the solution is a teleconverter, a device similar in concept to the wide-angle converter, except it's doing the reverse. It's magnifying, increasing the maximum telephoto, and bringing objects closer. So again, these are converters, so they do work at infinity and allow the lens to be zoomed. One of the common questions and the source of some confusion is the fact that almost invariably as you zoom to the wide end somewhere around the middle of the camera's zoom range you will start to get vignetting or portholing means you, as you keep going you eventually see a circle uh, with black around the edges. If you look at it you will see that the image is still in focus but it's not large enough to cover the field. The size of these adapters would be at least four times as large as they are and extremely heavy if you were trying to make something that would run through the, let you use the entire zoom range. It's just not a practical solution. And since what you're interested in is more telephoto, uh, working through at least the top half of the telephoto range is sufficient. The unit can always be removed. Once again, we use bayonets wherever possible to make it quick and easy. Uh, the power of the units ranges from two times to 1.6 times in the larger sizes and for the higher quality, it's more and more difficult to make a two times unit. Until very recently, our 1.6x tele was the only quality tele attachment available and the most powerful unit available to fit these camcorders. In response to customer demand and inquiry, we've just recently introduced a new 2X tele for these same cameras such as the Panasonic, Sony. Uh, it is larger and heavier by necessity, although we worked hard to keep the OD of the housing to 105 millimeters to ensure that it would remain compatible with many of the current matte boxes as well as 4x4 filters. Because of the weight and concern over causing strain on the lens and lens mount on the camera, the unit is supplied with a little support that will fit directly on any standard 15 millimeter rod support system that will let the tele attachment rest on it and take the weight off the front of the camera to minimize the chance of tweaking the front of the camera due to shock. Another issue with telephotos is flare and glare, especially when you're shooting uh, near uh, the light source such as the towards the sun or the light. Um, typical map boxes and shades are designed um, to cover the widest angle and aren't very effective in the telephoto range. So the unit is supplied with a deep shade that has a rectangular mask to help minimize the chance of stray light uh, causing flare or ghosting during the shooting. Another important and sometimes misunderstood accessory is the diopter or close-up lens. The lens, camera lenses have a certain minimum focus, uh, especially in the full telephoto range. The, the lens may let you get within, oh, three, four feet, a meter of the object, and you can't get any closer and use the full zoom range. If you want to get a very, very tight close-up, highly magnified, and be able to zoom in and out a bit to change the framing and size, it can be done via a close-up lens or diopter, which is a lot like a magnifying lens, but, but for the front of the camera. In their simplest form, diopters are a single element 
positive lens which lets you focus closer. Using a single element diopter becomes more of a problem. It introduces primarily chromatic aberration as well as astigmatism, some other, other aberrations. Century designed and produces achromatic diopters, which are two element diopters. By using two elements, it is possible to achieve good color correction and edge-to-edge -edge sharpness even in the greater strengths that are necessary to allow high magnifications. Diopters attach simply via the filter threads and are available in the standard filter sizes so that they can screw directly into the front of the camera. They're typically marked with the strength once again, which is the strength in diopters. And the higher the number, the key thing is the higher the number, the closer you can focus and therefore the more magnification. Here's two achromatic diopters. The smaller one is a plus two, the larger is a plus 3.5. The power is independent of the diameter of the diopter. It's an absolute and once again, Rough terms, if you divide, divide the number into one meter, it will tell you the, dis, the closest you can get from the front of the diopter to the object. So a plus two brings infinity on your lens down to half a meter. 40 inches is a meter, so 20 inches is the working distance. 3.5, you have to divide 3.5 into 40 inches or one meter and you get a working distance uh, of actually uh, less than a foot, about 10 inches or so I believe. Schneider Optics makes a complete range of filters for professional applications in film and video, both round screw-in filters and rectangular filters to be held in matte boxes and filter holders. Filters can be divided into four main groups ND filters, polarizing filters, color filters, and contrast or diffusion control type filters. Neutral density, commonly called ND filters, are a neutral gray, colorless filter whose purpose is to reduce the amount of light passing through it and darken the image. They are typically graded in uh, numbers like 0 0.3, 0 0.6, 0 0.9. In the neutral density scale, each 3 tenths or 0 0.3 uh, is equal to one full stop of attenuation, which means a 0 0.3 filter cuts the amount of light in half, a 0 0.6 20, gives you half again or 25%, and an ND9 half again or 12.5% or three full stops. The filters can be made also in graduated NDs. A common problem, and especially in video where the camera has less dynamic range, which means it cannot deal with extreme light and dark or change from light and dark as well as film, uh, the sky commonly is brighter than you would like by using an, a, a graduated filter, which is half clear and half ND, and positioning the filter so that the, uh, gra the line that separates the, the dark from the light is near the horizon, you can darken the sky, which prevents it from being overexposed or prevents the background from being underexposed because you'd have to make a choice otherwise. Uh, the actual graduation lines are graded in soft edge and hard edge. But the, the soft edge filter has a wider band where it blends from light to dark. The hard edge, the blending takes place much more quickly. With short focal length wide angle lenses and the type of lenses most common to video cameras, the most common choice would be a soft edge filter. If you're shooting more telephoto with longer focal length lenses, the hard edge line would be the most 
uh, common because the lens will tend to blend it or blur it. If you use a hard edge filter with a wide angle lens, you'll get a very sharp demarcation, which unless that's what you want, could be distracting. The other very important use of an ND filter is to let you control the camera aperture. This can do two things. By letting you choose the aperture that you're shooting at, you can control the depth of field. Video cameras tend to be very light sensitive, so in daylight, outside, they would tend to be stopped down and have a tremendous depth of field. By properly selecting ND filters, you can adjust the light level so that the iris of the camera will be more open at a wider aperture and you'll get a shallower depth of field which may give a more pleasing look. It may allow you to use focus isolation on your subject for emphasis. The other thing is that very short focal length lenses when they are stopped way down can actually lose resolving power and render an image that is less sharp. So in bright sunlight, the tendency of the video camera might be to want to stop down as much as it can, f22 or so. And by using the ND filter, you can, in the manual mode, get the iris back to f56 or f8, where the pictures will actually be noticeably sharper and better looking than they would be if they, the lens was stopped down all the way. Most video cameras do have some form of built-in ND. Uh, one, may, sometimes maybe two filters. There are two problems with that. One uh, tends to usually be quite a dense filter, so you don't have the fine steps of control which will let you tailor the transmission and therefore the f-stop you're shooting at to your choice. Second, the in-camera filters commonly are a gel type material which over time could warp or distort. Uh, the glass filters uh, will be very consistent as you change from grade to grade. Uh, the look will be exactly the same except for the transmission. So many users prefer to always use fil ND filters in front of the lens as opposed to the built-in ND filter in the camera. Polarizing filter is a gray filter and looks very much like an ND filter and typically does absorb almost two stops of light, which means in terms of transmission, it has about the same effect as a 0.6 ND filter. The unique feature of the polarizer is that it only will transmit light, which the light waves are aligned in a certain pattern that matches the materials in the filter. So that as the filter is rotated, it will block any light waves except those that are aligned with the polarizer. Since most light is very diffused and the light waves are, are uh, uh, almost random in their orientation, you don't see an effect. When light is reflected off a surface, whether it be water, glass, metal, that reflected light is polarized. Therefore, the common use for a polarizer is by aligning it so that the polarizing material will cancel out the polarized light and the reflection, you can reduce or eliminate the reflection so that you can see through windows, shoot through car windows, eliminate the glare on the water as you desire. Another benefit and a common use is because of the way they work and the way they absorb light, they will tend to make a blue sky appear bluer by by cutting down on the scattered light in the sky, which will make clouds look whiter. Also tends to make colors look a little more vibrant, not 
as much as an enhancing filter, but it gives a little bit of that look. Polarizers come in two types that create a certain amount of confusion. There's the linear polarizer, which is the standard polarizer that uh, everybody's probably the most familiar with. Then there is the circular polarizer. And circular does not refer to the shape of the polarizer, but refers to the design and effect of the polarizer. So circular polarizers can be rectangular, they can be round. It has nothing to do with the shape. Uh, circular polarizers were developed because some cameras, based on the design of their metering systems, and uh, other features, autofocus systems, and this is especially true in still cameras, uh, can be affected by the polarizer. The polarizer, uh, because these metering systems use reflected light from mirrors or prisms, uh, which can be polarized, can be interfered with by a linear polarizer and the, the metering system in, with the polarizer just happens to wind up in the wrong position, it can block the metering system. This, while this is theoretically a problem with the prisms in video cameras, in practical sense, uh, it has not been much of an issue. And so, uh, the linear polarizer, which is less expensive to make uh, and, and therefore less expensive to buy, uh, is satisfactory in almost all instances. Just so you know what the circular polarizer does is the front part of it, the front half is just a standard polarizer. On the back, there is a quarter wave retarder, which in simple terms simply takes the polarized light and then depolarizes it so it's random, so that the light coming out the back of the polarizer and into the camera is no longer all aligned with the waves the same way. Your pol polarized light is not going into the camera, but, but the front blocks, so they work exactly the same. They have to be mounted, they're marked, it says this side out. If you mount them the wrong way, they still work as a standard polarizer, but you don't get the effect of the circular polarizer. Um, and that's it. So the main thing to remember is the circular polarizer is designed to solve some specific problems and is not an issue in the typical video camera. A third type of ND filter, and a very specialized one, is called an attenuator. Similar in concept to an ND grad, uh, the filter is clear, but clear only at the very bottom, and then it, in a uniform, gradual way, goes from clear to quite dense, as dense as 1.2, which would be four full stops at the top. There could be certain scenes where, for practical or for aesthetic reasons, you want to darken the scene or lighten the scene if you put the filter upside down uh, as you go from top to bottom. And this filter will let you do it. Uh, used a lot in commercials where they're trying to create certain emphasis or looks. A third type of filters are colored filters. And we'll talk briefly about those. Colored filters have been most commonly used in film and not as commonly used in video. There are those who believe that in spite of the ability to manipulate color more easily in the digital world in post-production, that by coloring in the camera and getting something that approaches the final look, you have more room to adjust and more space to play in in post. There are others that just simply believe in wanting to record the image as close to the way they want it to look as possible. So colored filters allow you to tint a scene, just sort of change the overall look, change the color temperature of the scene. Graduated colored filters let you do the same thing but in a selective way. 
In this picture, you can see that the foreground looks a little bit washed out and brown by using a gold filter. It would be possible in aligning the, the grad line to get a much more golden look, a more pleasant and pleasing look. By the same token, the sky could be made bluer. It's even possible to combine both filters and get a bluer sky and a warmer foreground. Sometimes filters are developed for a specific director of photography for a specific film because of some unique aspect of the shooting. Recently, when they were making the movie Sahara, the director of photography wanted a specific look, a warmth. They were having problems with the cold shadow in the desert, and so a filter, which is now called Sahara Gold, was developed specifically to address that need. And this sort of thing happens time from time. We work closely with the professionals using the equipment to tailor the product to their specific application when practical. The last general grouping of filter types are what we would call diffusion filters. Filters that are designed to change the texture, the resolution, the contrast, the look of the image, not to change the color or the density or the, the things that the other types of filters we've talked about do. These can be filters which uh, can be used to blend uh, wrinkles and things on talent's faces to make them look younger and more pleasing. Uh, they can be filters that are designed to reduce the contrast. One of the things people associate with the video look is the uh, bright colors, the saturation of the colors, and the, the kind of edgy feel to it. It looks too sharp, it looks too real. So there are filters designed to reduce that, to soften that, uh, to mute the colors a little bit. Uh, these are commonly referred to by their manufacturers' names, s such as a Pro Mist or a Black Frost or a mist type filter. Uh, there are other very specialized filters like uh, classic softs uh, that Schneider makes that are designed to hide things or minimize things like wrinkles and blemishes without uh, causing so much diffusion, flaring, glowing that is obvious that diffusion is being used. Uh, we've developed a new filter called a Digicon specifically to try to compress the dynamic range a bit to help the, in video handle a wide variance from light to dark uh, to uh, make, give you more shadow detail without blowing out the highlights.